Welcome to Tanversations. I'm Tanya, a 20-something working in venture capital and excited about the Web3 space. In this podcast, I'm going to be diving into the biggest questions that I have, mostly about work, but also about life and everything in between by turning to my elders that include venture capitalists, experts, entrepreneurs, writers, philosophers, activists, and even 26-year-olds. So grab your pumpkin spice lattes, kombucha, iced coffee, and 16th other beverage as we go through these conversations together. My guest for today is Molly Bloom, on whom the Oscar-nominated movie Molly's Game is based. Molly actually started her career as an athlete. She was ranked third overall in North America for skiing, but at the Olympic qualifiers, she injured herself and decided to officially retire. After that, she moved to LA, where she worked many jobs, including being an executive assistant. Her manager asked her to be a waitress at a weekly poker game that he used to run that was frequented by some of the biggest celebrities, Wall Street titans, and CEOs in the world. Regulars of the game included people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, and Ben Affleck. She recognized the opportunity that being in that room gave her. It gave her access to information and to power. So she used poker as her Trojan horse into the highest levels of business and society. Within eight months, she went from being a waitress to that game to running the game. She went up against the Billionaire Boys Club as a 22-year-old and won by asking them to abandon her manager's game and to play at hers instead. By the time she was 26, she was running the biggest, richest underground poker game in the world. And she was also the owner-operator as well as the bank for the game. It was also during this time that she ran into trouble. Without her knowing, some of the players in the game were actually members of the Russian mafia, which which resulted in her being arrested by the feds and them seizing all her assets, which were worth over $5 million. At that point, she had an option of getting all her money back and having no criminal record if she handed over the hard drives that had information of all the games. But despite the risk of losing all her money and her freedom, she did not give that information up because it would impact so many careers, families, and children. Although she did not end up going to prison, she did lose all her money. At 35, she was broke and moved back in with her parents. But she did not give up. She knew that her story was the monetizable asset she had and wrote a book so she could own the IP for it. Then she pitched her story to Aaron Sorkin, the writer of Moneyball, Social Network, and Trial of Chicago 7, to write her story. He agreed to do it and direct it. In 2017, the movie came out, and in 2018, it got nominated for an Oscar. Since then, Molly has been a very sought-after speaker, traveling the world and sharing her story of redemption. Going from an Olympic-class skier to the operator of the largest underground poker game to the subject of an Oscar-nominated movie, She's lived a bigger life in every decade of her existence than most people ever live. I'm so excited to have her on my podcast, where we actually talk about the story of how we met. Molly started a community during the COVID time, after which we stayed in touch. And she's taken out time every week from her extremely busy schedule to answer my big and small questions. So in this interview, we talk about the journey that we went through together and how she's helped me overcome some of the biggest fears in my life and truly get to know myself. Because of her, I've been able to have a better relationship with people in my life, but most importantly, with myself. In this interview, she also talks about what leaning into your femininity means to her and how she actually used that as her superpower. Why there's a difference between acting on your instincts versus being yourself. How to show up with agency and relationships and her advice for young girls starting out their careers. Okay, so I actually wanted to start with the story of how we met. And I remember (laughs) I actually watched Molly's Game in 2019, like December 2019 and I was like very blown away by the movie 
And then in 2020, when COVID happened, then you started this online community. And I really wanted to go over this because I feel like you've done so many interviews, but people really don't cover this. And it was so important because for me, at least, it was the highlight of the whole COVID period. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about that. So, you know, you started this community to help people bring them together during this really incredibly difficult time. And you brought on a lot of experts. So there was, I remember there was Bobby Brown, there was Heather, who at the time was at BlackRock, your brother. Then we started meditating, we were reading books. And I actually have been meditating since then. <laughs> so yeah, it was quite life-changing for me. And then we just kind of stayed in touch after that. But what was your thought process in bringing these people together during this really difficult time? Um, I remember uh, COVID, you know, the, the shutdowns happened. Uh, everyone was home from work. No one really knew what was going on. Um, and there was a ton of uncertainty and fear. And I had been really working hard for the, during that time in my life at, kind of solving for the inner human condition of struggle and resisting fear. And I had recently come into a place in my life where I had found a really robust community um, that changed my life, truly. I mean, I, I before prior to that, I'd always kind of been a soloist and at times a bit of a nihilist. <laughs> But I had found this community and um, it, it really, uh, it changed my life. And so it was pretty clear to Devin and I, uh, Devin's the father of my child, uh, that we wanted to do something um, to, to participate in the solution. And so our idea was, let's host something every day, um, invite everybody in the world and um, not only create content that could be educational or life-changing, but also bring people together so that they can form this community during this really scary, uncertain time. And we didn't know what was going to happen, but we thought that that was what we could spend our, you know, part of our days doing. And it turned out to be this really beautiful thing that we did for a year, very labor intensive, <laughs> yeah, but very um, beautiful. And I think long lasting in that a lot of people said that they had never had a community like this. And I think a really important thing that we realized is you can't just bring people together and throw them together. There needs to be a culture. Yeah, There needs to be this culture. There needs to be these this sort of suggested way of acting. And that is unconditional love, support, non-judgment, um, really and truly listening to people, uh, even if you feel like they're wacky or you don't agree with their viewpoints. And I think One World, which is what we ended up calling it, really thrived under those conditions and everybody rose to the occasion. And it was this incredible time where we got to meet people from literally all over the world. And we met every day. And I got to meet you and you yeah. blew me away. I, I just could not believe how intelligent and thoughtful and cool you were. And so I just knew that I wanted to stay in touch with you and be part of your journey if you'd let me. Oh. And, and it was, um, you know, it, it was just a, it's, it's been a huge honor to work with you and, and see how you have dug in and transformed certain things and taken really an honest inventory of where, you know, where you need to do work or, or things you need to face and done it in such a brave and, and uh, thorough way. And it's just been a very cool experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually went back when I was kind of researching for this podcast. So I went back to like that email that I sent you. So I remember uh, I think it was the time when we were just kind of closing down the community and it was kind of dividing into different subgroups. Mm -hmm. And so I remember sending you this email, so I'm just going to read it out. 
<laughs> yeah, so it was on the last call, listening to everyone talk about the impact you've created in their lives through sponsoring, mentoring, or creating One World was amazing. And even for me, getting support from you uh, every day and on my blogs and writings has been great. One World has been such a driving and motiva motivating force, especially during this time when there's so much uncertainty. And I've also been thinking about how there are such few people in the world who I look up to for both their achievements and who they are as people. And you're one of the only few people in the world like that for me. And it's been so great getting to know you. I've mentioned this a few times, but I really hope I can be like you someday. And so I wanted to reach out to see if there was any way that we could work together. And please let me know. I think it would just be so great to learn from you. And yeah, and then you so cutely responded saying, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about this and how I can support you. I'm so impressed with who you are and let's set up a call. And since then, honestly, you've taken like time out every week just to talk to me about everything that's been going on you know in my life I met you when I was in uni and since then I've graduated gotten my first job and then many jobs after that gotten into relationships had a really bad breakup moved countries so many milestones and so I really want to kind of dip into some of these things and you know everything that I've learned from you through all of these experiences and I think one of the reasons that I really related to you was because you were this woman who was extremely successful in a very male-dominated industry and you did that while still kind of staying very feminine and almost using that as your superpower and I kind of relate to that because I'm not very I'm not like this very aggressive very transactional person and so what is actually leaning into your femininity and using that as a superpower mean to you, especially when you're working with men around you? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I want to understand first your definition of femininity, because it sounds like what you're referring to is is more of a, a gentleness yeah, as opposed to aggression. And, um, you know, because I think leaning into your femininity can get a bit misconstrued sometimes if people think like oh does that mean you're flirting with everyone yeah. or you know which listen no judgment there either <laughs> you know but I think what I really decided was that I was going to be me and I wasn't going to change myself for the context that I was in which was a very aggressive um somewhat savage and untrustworthy world of the gambling world. And that didn't feel good to me. And that didn't feel right. And I sort of had to be who I had to be. And there were times in the duration that I ran these games where I tried that on, you know, I tried to get all like, okay, you know, I'm a hustler. And like, the only thing that matters is the bottom line. And that just wasn't me. And so what I did is I, I retained the parts of me that were authentic and that were important. And, and that was, um, being an understanding person, um, being tapped into how other people are feeling and be, and having it be a priority that my impact on their life is positive. Um, when people are in fear, sometimes that presents as really bad behavior recognizing that the fear underpins it and trying to do something about that. I think that's both compassionate and intelligent Yeah. Um, because battling it out rarely <laughs> works. And there's this thing called effective presence. And it's a really strong indicator of how people fare in the world. And effective presence is essentially being, a, being able to make people feel good in your presence. And, um, you know, there have been times where I've had to draw lines for sure. This is not to say don't have boundaries. Yeah. This is not to say be a doormat. That is absolutely not the the directive. But I have found that human beings are emotional creatures, animals, deeply emotional. Almost all decisions are are triggered by emotion. 
led by emotion. Almost all behavior is. And so if you can learn how to be a trustworthy person, to be an empathetic, compassionate person, to be someone who's positive and to, and to sort of work on this craft of how do I make people feel great in my presence? Um, th those are all things that have really been huge assets to me um, and really largely responsible for my success in, in the different um, sort of places that I've, that I've wanted to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really delicate balance to kind of still hold that gentleness, but, you know, still have your boundaries. And that's something, you know, we worked on quite a bit. <laughs> and sure. yeah, I think especially, you know, work, of course, but even with personal relationships, I think, uh, you know, it's been a huge thing where, uh, I think boundaries really protect you. And I've realized from you that it takes very, it's very different. You know, you can't be the same way that you are at work in your personal life. And mm -hmm. I think last year I was, uh, of course, I was in this really bad kind of relationship. And <laughs> it was, uh, I remember I actually had a call with you. And normally at the time, at least, I think we we mostly used to talk about books and like work related things on these calls. And then but there was just this moment where it was just so awful. And I felt like I was going through this really terrible experience. And I remember I had this call with you and you're just like, hey, how's it going? And I was just like a full breakdown moment. And I was like, yeah. And then you were just like, okay, you were right. Like what happened? And, you know, obviously in that moment, I was like, you know, there's this extremely successful woman who's taking our time to talk to you. And I don't want to bother her with this steady, you know, boy problems that I have. But also at the time, I was so overpowering. So I remember talking to you about it. And I also remember you were so nice about it. And you were just like, you know, in this moment, I'm not going to kind of force you to break up with him, even though I know you should, because <laughs> <laughs> you're just going <laughs> to start hiding things from me. But instead, I'm just going to help you build yourself up. And one day you just won't be able to unsee it. And you'll come tell me that you're ready to break up. And it was true. <laughs> and I think we also went quite a bit over some of the relationship patterns that I've had. I think, at least for me, and I think you shared that it was quite similar for you in the past. But there was a lot of power asymmetry. So I think at least with my first relationship, I was 17, he was 23, which was quite a large age difference back then. And then with my second relationship, you know, I was from a really small town in India and he was from this very influential family in Hong Kong. And it was like a whole other world for me at mm -hmm. the time. And I think I just kind of got so lost in it. And so I wanted to hear from you, what was the process like for you to build yourself up and to actually have agency over yourself and relationships, especially when you're, you know, say dating someone who's, there's a lot of power asymmetry in that dynamic. Um, well, I think that the goal is to never let the asymmetry, asymmetry happen. Because that's generally the beginning of the end for a relationship. Or a guaranteed miserable relationship. Yeah. Um, I think retaining, keeping, reclaiming your power is as important as anything we can do in the world. Um, and uh, I remember the first time I ever fell in love. I was younger than he was. He was this big sports star at my school. I was kind of this insecure bookworm and I fell head over heels and, and um, he knew it and he leveraged it. He leveraged his power and, 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 and that relationship ended up being extremely toxic, extremely unhealthy and extremely painful. And I remember when it was over, I decided that that was never going to happen to me again. Um, not that I'm not going to open myself up and um, hurt and, and want to fall in love and want to have relationships. 
I was never going to let someone take my power like that again, ever. And I think the first part of this equation is making that choice, making the choice that you're going to prioritize yourself, your mental health, your being over any man, any woman, any circumstance. And I think that you have to make that choice on a daily basis sometimes. And it's a matter of changing the brain if the brain needs to be changed. Um, I was really looking for validation in the world, uh, yeah. particularly for men. And so I had to make that choice over and over and over and over. And I had to do things that built my self-esteem. And two of the biggest things that I think that we can do are esteemable acts. So being a good person and being accountable to yourself. So that means if I say I'm going to read 20 pages a day, I'm going to read 20 pages a day. If I say that I'm going to... um you know, do meditate 30 minutes a day. I'm going to thir- med- thir- meditate 30 minutes a day, not perfection. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes we sometimes can give ourselves outs, but knowing that we can count on ourselves, yeah. knowing that we can be accountable to ourselves, knowing that we have this power. And then the third part is, you know, I remember the next relationship I got in, I felt that that feeling, which is probably biology, you know, biology that has allowed uh, the the human species to sustain. If we weren't driven on like such an intense level to get into relationships and to essentially procreate, species doesn't pr- sustain. So it's a lot. So there's a lot of like, I got to get involved here, you know? And I remember the next relationship I was in, I started to feel that like franticness, like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I need this to work. And if it's not going to work, I'm not going to be okay. Which puts you in this very disempowered position to put up with a lot of shit, you know? And I just remember having to like work on myself. And I remember having to say every day, okay, am I being treated well? Am I, you know, am I in control of myself? Am I waiting to see if he text messages me or if he behaves in this way that's valuing me and showing me that he's really interested and I remember like halfway through that relationship I didn't I felt like he was flirting with a lot of other girls and and even though like I really wanted to just hold on to it I remember saying to him and it was so hard Mm -hmm. it was so counter to anything that like felt right I remember saying to him voice shaking, you know, cause it's hard to stand up. It's hard to start using your power and using your voice. You know what? Um, I don't think this is working out. And I broke up with him and you know what happened? He became obsessed <laughs> with me and we got back together eventually. And I never let my power go again. And it was a great relationship because he knew on some level I could bounce. Yeah. You know, that if, that if, that if he's not treating me properly, I'm out. And that was like, so freaking empowering (laughs) to know that I'm choosing myself, my power over this frantic need to, to be with someone. And I have employed that ever since. And like, you know, I, I, I've never, I've never given up my power again. And it not only makes you feel great, it puts you in a great position to have great relationships, Mm -hmm. you know, and to walk away from the ones that are not great. Yeah. Yeah. It's just about walking into the discomfort, you know, and doing it over and over until you're like, I got this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hard part. It is, but yeah. once you do it a couple times, you your world opens up. Yeah, because you're not a slave to your emotions or your thoughts, or your you know sort of dr- lower nature drives. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, I actually also wanted to talk a lot about, you know, this whole thing of going against your instincts and why, you know, a lot of times people confuse being yourself with actually doing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just following your instincts, even though they might not be serving you. And of course, we did a lot of work on this. You know, I remember we read, I read so many books on Buddhism, philosophy, therapy, and I think at the end of the day, they all had very similar messages and you kind of start seeing patterns. Mm -hmm. And of course, for me, I feel like through this whole journey, I've completely changed and my relationships have gotten so much better with friends, so much family, better. boys, with myself, I think most importantly with myself. And what was the process like for you and when you were going going through this journey for yourself? Are you were looking more inwards and versus, you know, seeking that external validation? And why do you think it's important for other people to do it as well? It's been a it's been a 44 year journey, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, I kind of like got the the relationship with boys thing early on, but then I didn't necessarily conquer, you know, seeking out that validation. I just, I pursued it in, in other ways. And I also, um, you know, I mean, I, I also used different substances, success, money to sort of treat the the emptiness inside, the ache inside, the feeling that I'm not good enough inside. And so, you know, during my life and during different events, there's just been different chapters of this work. And I think that the work is lifelong, but uh, something that was two things that were completely life-changing for me, because when I, when my life fell apart, you know, when I was, I found myself 35 years old, millions of dollars in debt, a convicted felon, basically a social pariah tabloids telling this really reductive story about me about basically that I'm like some girl in a tight skirt that you know flirts with poker people when in essence I'd kind of created this hundred million dollar business and and dealt with learning how to run it without any protection without capital behind me you know becoming the bank for it and, and in this underground non-conventional world where you basically, it's like a video game, like, you know, like everyone's out to get you and, and whatever. Um, but, you know, but, but I found myself in, in completely ruined and, um, or in ruination. And so then I had to really look at all that stuff and let go of all of it, all of the, like, um, I need validation right now because. I had failed so spectacularly, you know, I was like living with my mom and my grandma at 35, so few friends. And so that's when I really had to, if I wasn't going to stay there and there's this terrifying moment where I was like, you know, like, it's like Mel Robbins said, no one's coming for you. Yeah. You know, you, if you don't make moves, you're going to stay here in your mom's basement forever. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like we're gonna have to get a little gangster with it it's like this is gonna have to be like the next next level and so that's when I started to learn about meditation that's when I started to learn about this sort of like the path of the 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 spiritual warrior where you sit face to face with the things that you're afraid of with this idea this terrifying idea that you're not good enough um, with this terrifying idea that you're going to be alone or you're not going to amount to anything. And you start to sit with that and you start to face that and you start to do work with that instead of getting on social media, watching Netflix, getting mess, you know, doing drugs, drinking, partying, uh, you know, dating 17 different guys at the same time, whatever it is that you're running, that you're using to run from that stuff. And so I learned how to sit with it and face it and, and open my mind and my heart to it and be like, you know, like, um, it's okay that these fears are there, but it's not the truth. Yeah. 
and I have some agency here. And the next thing that I learned how to do is, is meditate. And meditation changed the game for me because the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal is our focus. Whatever we focus on is going to create our life. Whatever thoughts we focus on, whatever behavior we focus on, what whatever content we focus on, that's shaping our brain, our behavior, our thoughts, and thus our life. And so many of us, myself included, aren't the driver behind focus. We get caught up in all the stuff, the, the thoughts that are in my head, what other people are thinking, you know, this, this distraction, this distraction, this distraction. And what meditation, Vipassana, insight meditation taught me how to do is to start to become the master and the driver of that focus. You sit for 20 minutes and all the thoughts and all the circus comes up and you bring your focus back to the breath over and over and over. And that repetitive uh, action starts to allow you to direct your attention where you want to go, to ignore what you want to ignore, to refocus, to pivot, to be nimble. And, and that was just so life-changing. And that's why, you know, when you and I worked together, I, I stressed that so much. Yeah. Um, particularly if you have an overactive mind, particularly if you have an emotionally complex mind, you know, particularly if there's a lot going on in there, like an internal critic and, and, you know, a, a overemphasis on what people are thinking. This is so important. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And what do you think are good ways for people who say, don't have you in their lives to be able to do it themselves. You know, were they like book recommendations, apps, yeah. like that? that yeah. Um, the first book recommendation I would give is The Untethered Soul. Mm -hmm. There's this line in The Untethered Soul that I remember reading and having this complete light bulb moment. And it was, you are not the voice in your head. You're the one that hears it. And that sounds like this really simple statement, but then you think about it and you're like, there is this part of my brain or my consciousness that can hear the thoughts, which means I can have agency over that. And there, and I can strengthen the part that hears it, the part that I'm in control of. And that was really life-changing for me. And the untethered soul was really life-changing for me. And then I think an app like Headspace uh, is a great place to start, but my recommendation is to start very small, um, to start with just a couple, 30 seconds the first day, if that's, if that feels right and, and slowly build. And if you're having a hard time getting into meditation, which I have been since I had a, a baby, prime it a little bit. So wake up, have this, you know, Spotify playlist of like, meditation music, listen to that meditation music, do a little bit of breath work, do a body scan, and then, you know, do your, do your meditation. Um, and, you know, then just sort of making it this manageable thing in your life. So it's not so uncomfortable. It's not so painful. And then I, in my experience, what happened is after a couple of weeks, things started to change for me. And then after a couple of months, things started to change for me so dramatically that I got scared about ever going back to the way that it was. And so that's what sort of keeps me on, on track. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was the same for me. It was just this one day when it kind of clicked for a long yeah. time, like nothing was happening. Yeah. One day it just clicked and I was like, whoa, <laughs> this yeah. what it feels like to not be anxious. And then yes yeah and to feel yeah. empowered and to feel like you have power over your mind over your thoughts over your emotions and over the outcome yeah 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 that's yeah. what we all want right <laughs> to be able to influence the outcome to be able to have a goal or a dream or uh an idea of of who and what you want to be and then to be able to deliver on that yeah yeah so speaking of what are your goals or what are you working on next? Um, 
I'm working on my next book. I'm working on a documentary. And what I really want to do is build a community that in which this community can help um, the members with the things that we're talking about here. Because what I realize is that self-help is very limited mm -hmm. because we work much better. We heal much better. We're collaborative. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of social rewards for doing, for, you know, sort of trying to accomplish things in, within a community. Yeah. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think the last question that I have is what advice would you have for young girls who are in university, just graduating, you know, just starting out their journeys? Yeah. Um, now is the time to start figuring out how to become the master of your own destiny, to have to get agency, to get power. Um, and what that can look like uh, is, you know, sort of what we're talking about here. Um, doing this work on emotional regulation, on becoming the driver of your mind, um, walking into discomfort if it means that you're choosing your dignity, uh, starting to do these things that are hard, that seem foreign, but that will change the trajectory of your life. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Really You're appreciate welcome. you. My pleasure. Taking out the time. Yeah. And for you.